Thank you for joining us. We are now about to begin our panel on de the democratization of finance from mobile money to crypto assets in partnership with Tangent. Please feel free to enter questions in the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen, and the moderator will take them at the end if time permits. I will now hand things over to our moderator, moderator Rumi. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure being here with everyone. I'd love to welcome my guests after just a brief introduction of our panel topic, which is around the democratization of finance. As we all know, you know, for decades now, banks have tried to provide financial services to nearly 1.7 billion unbanked people, um, but be able to do this in a profitable way. Uh, the internet and telecom networks and telcos have tried to step in and provide a range of digital offerings, but I think as many of us might agree that the advent of cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance and blockchain technologies might be, might be, and this is what the panel is here for, able to fully break through and democratize finance in such a way that we can reach the underbanked population, unbanked population all around the world. Um, my name is Rumi Morales. I'm a partner at Outlier Ventures, and I'm incredibly honored to moderate this panel with four very distinguished speakers. I would love for them to introduce themselves, um, starting with Danelle from Stellar. Hi, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, my name is Danelle Dixon. I'm the CEO of the Stellar Development Foundation. Um, and we are focused on creating a, a equitable access to the global financial system using the Stellar Network, which is a blockchain that's focused on payments. And uh, it's pretty remarkable what we, what we can do. And I'm really I'm looking forward to talking with everyone here. Thanks so much, Danelle. For those who know, Stellar was incredibly early on focusing on cross-border payment issues and in a very sharp and technologically advanced way, oh, something that I've, I have admired greatly for years. Uh, our next speaker is Sean Ford from Algorand. Sean, you're on mute if you can unmute yourself real quick. They figure out the technology. Hi, I'm Sean. Uh, thank you to the GBBC for uh, having having me here today. I really appreciate it. Algorand is a, a next generation blockchain protocol that launched a little over a year ago, uh, founded by uh, Sylvia McCalley, who's a Turing Award winner in 2012 out of MIT. Um, we've seen great growth and great transaction in what we would call broadly finance, DeFi, central bank digital currencies, and traditional uh, payments and traditional financial institutions and uh, as a topic near and dear to our hearts. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Sean. Uh, in our pre-call, I let Sean know when I heard and I saw the news that Algorand had been financed some around a year plus ago. I was so jealous for not being part of that because what they built is incredibly uh, fascinating and I think a very important part of our infrastructure financially and beyond going forward. Um, now I'd love for Sergio, if you wouldn't mind sharing some about you and Tangem. I know you're featured here uh, on this panel. And you're on mute as well. So if you could unmute yourself, it's okay. There you go. Thanks to you and thanks for uh, GVC to organize uh, this amazing event. I have too much to talk about myself, so I'll talk about what I do now. And uh, it is um, CEO at Tangem. Uh, we provide universal access to digital assets, uh, having understood that uh, the greatest point of friction for decentralized technologies and let's say uh, cryptographically secure assets to reach every one citizen on the world is um, interface and access. We focused on a solution that starts from hardcore chip technology and goes all the way to um, putting in the hands of everyone. Great, thank you. And last but not least is Fernando um, from QR Capital. Please go ahead and share some about your background. Are we able to, um, sorry, I'm just jumping in. Is everyone able to hear Fernando? No, <laughs> we're not batting so well here, friends. Um, Fernando, it seems like you're not on mute, but I was, I was just wondering if you could try uh, speaking again. No. Um, 
Maybe, for, I'm sorry, Fernando, we're still trying to hear what you're saying. Um, I don't know if you can test your mic separately or someone from the GBPC can assist you um, as we would love to hear what you would like to share with us. <laughs> No, sorry, I can read your lips. It's not better now, but it's okay. We'll try something else. Um, how about this? I will just start us off a little bit when you're able to join in. We'd love to hear you. Alice, feel free to write in the chat as well. But, you know, this panel is around democratization, and yet I think some people interchangeably use uh, financial inclusion as well. Um, I was wondering if we could just start off, perhaps, Sergio, with you to talk about what do we mean by financial inclusion and or the democratization of finance? Are they the same things? What is a very, what is, what is truly important here as we think about the underbanked community? Yeah, so the definition of the problem is very important and it is huge and it is very intertwined with other major uh, challenges. And that is really the, um, the, the hard part that if you look at financial inclusion just as uh, access to payments, and a wallet or an account, then you're missing um, a lot of um, aspects of how that is understood, not from us, that we're clearly, um, I would say the 1%, I hope, I don't offend anyone, but it, uh, we have a perspective on the world that usually works around having very fast access to a lot of services. And in fact, we have the option of choice and it is, um, it's a little too easy. Whereas when we look at the 1.7 billion people that today are either underbanked or non-banked, uh, not only they have access, don't have access to payments and savings and credit and insurance and everything that is built on top of it, but also they don't. Uh, they already have alternatives that are uh, limiting by definition. For example, I did some research in the past years and I realized that most of the saving mechanisms for this 1.7 billion are called uh, um, ROSCA, ROSCA or ASCA, which means Rotating Saving and Credit Association or Accumulating Saving and Credit Association, whereby uh, people in a small community, which could be a working community or family or village, put together money and keep it together. They pool it literally either to extract it monthly on turn or uh, to save it and invest it in, in businesses or in various infrastructure activities for their community. And this is just one aspect I could talk for hours, but that's um, that's telling already about how they see the world and coming in with a mobile wallet, be it managed by a telco like mobile money or be it on an app or doesn't matter how it is, um, will it really solve that problem? Will it bring them to, to the next level? Will it allow, will it allow them to have systems uh, that, that open uh, for trade and the insurance, not always. And in fact, if we look at um, the World Bank data, besides all the data that's already available, the one that strikes me most is that in 10 years of work from 2001 to nine, so nine years, um, the banked adults were brought from 50% to 70%. That's, it's a lot of people, but way to go. A lot, so, a lot of out. There's yeah. a lot missing. And um, I also think that we're pretty much already hit the ceiling for what we can do with uh, centralized legacy-based systems like mobile money, which are usually telco-driven and therefore have limitations in scope because they can clearly be only pushed by throwing more phones in the market mm -hmm. and have limitations by functionality because uh, openness is really not the first, uh, the first um, um, incentive when it comes to, to having these systems uh, uh, work like open banking in Europe or, or in the US. Right, and the incentive problem is certainly a, a, a big challenge. Fernando, I see we have you back. Would you like, are you able to uh, share your greatness with us now? Oh no. <laughs> Well, you know what Just you can do. Yeah, yeah. Hold, hold some signs up, and we, we'll read them off for you. Um, we're still very happy to have you here. Feel free to add questions into the chat, and we'll continue to work on um, your 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 audio. Um, Danelle, following up on some of what Sergio was saying, obviously, I mean, banks have been around for a long time, but so have you know, technology providers and others trying to focus on this issue of democratization of finance and financial inclusion. What have been the barriers up until this point, or perhaps more positively speaking, what are we on the cusp of now as we think about distributed ledgers and how this might make a difference? 
Yeah, that, thank you so much. Like, I think that there are there's so many reasons for the barriers or what the barriers are to financial inclusion. I think four of them that are the top ones that I think we can tackle. It's the lack of the financial education and financial literacy is one of them. The second one is a lack of formal sector employment or formal documentation required to open accounts. Mm -hmm. um, this is often especially the case for women who work in the informal economy a lot of times. Um, the third is like costs associated with accounts, especially when many of the underbanked and unbanked report, they just don't have enough money to open a bank account in the first place. So they don't have room for that extra expense. And then I think the fourth one is like the physical distance that we take it for granted what for in most places that, that um, we sit, but there's a lack of local infrastructure. And when these rural based folks have to rely on uh, inefficient or volatile financial options, like keeping their savings at home or traveling long distances to make payments happen. And I think that uh, financial inclusion then is really about designing solutions that are sensitive to these points, to cost, to the culture and the connectivity issues. And I really think uh, that, you know, that blockchain and DLTs can really help there. I love that. I love your points around education, literacy, the ability to open an account, but even once you do the cost associated with it and the physical distance and the way you really touched upon the culture, which I think is critical here. Um, you know, in our panel, I would love now to kind of dig, dig deeply into two areas, one on the blockchain side of the world, the others on the tokens and the asset side of the world, but then think then ahead about um, how this all comes together. Uh, Sean, as we think about blockchain technologies though, um, like I said, Danelle did a great job laying out for broad issues, but just diving deeply onto the tech side to make democratization of finance possible. How does blockchain technology, the tech itself, uh, really help us to uh, address barriers to inclusion? Yeah, you know, we talk about this all the time. I think that the first thing, just to hold ourselves accountable uh, as an industry or as a technology, first thing that blockchain has to do in order to uh, drive inclusion is it, it needs to actually become something that enables it rather than itself uh, act as a barrier. Uh, you know, if you look at the number of people who are familiar with blockchain, to Danelle's point, you know, it's not just educating about finance, it's also educating, in our case, about what the potential of blockchain is. Um, I think that if, uh, if you can start to go down a path that says, uh, you know, blockchain is something that is public, permissionless, easy to adopt, and actually understandable, uh, that's a first step. I think certainly, uh, you know, one of the things that you need as part of a, a growing and vibrant economy is financial inclusivity. But there's also inclusivity, to my first point, that really comes back to things like genuine participation and engagement, right. a desire to build and create, uh, not just transact. And if you look at economic indicators, the confidence that those types of things bring are really the things that end up uh, turbocharging what we think the potential for blockchain is. And then, you know, if you do come back to the technical infrastructure, you know, we need something that actually drives that confidence and drives right. inclusion. And I think a number of barriers exist that prevent access from being simple, which is one of the things that Algorand has tried to tried to do with our public and permissionless approach. Uh, I also think the allow allow people to Danelle's point about um, you know the, the costs associated, the costs on Algorand are intentionally kept uh, to uh, minuscule amounts. One twentieth of a, a U.S. cent uh, is the cost there to allow for uh, the removal of those barriers and the ability to create micro payments. If you look at a lot of places out there, um, you know a lot of people don't have the wherewithal to even set up an account or make payments at levels that are required to address those costs. But blockchain allows you to disaggregate, create micro payments, and really offer a financial window for people who might not have been able to participate before to now be able to do it as long as they have access to some basic technology like even just a cell phone uh, that would certainly make a big dent in um, in some of the unbanked issues that Danelle talked about and certainly how blockchain uh, start to achieve its promise sure and I really like your focus on the technical infrastructure and the the common about 120th of a US cent is pretty impressive I do have to ask though around this issue of cost, there are many countries and places where you don't have the, just the basic technology infrastructure to be, to be able to support um, some of these, uh, you know, the, the new tech that might need to 
ride on older rails, whether it's around broadband or Wi-Fi connectivity or what have you. Um, I'm going to push on this issue of cost a little bit and ask if blockchain is truly ready right now. Maybe Algorand is special. I think it is. But in general, are blockchains truly ready right now to be cost effective? Or what are the advantages um, that current solutions still might be able to have? Fernando, I'm going to try you again if you want to talk a little bit about um, blockchain-based alternatives either being cheaper or more effective than current solutions. <laughs> Anyone? No? Well, I'm so sorry, Fernando. We're going to keep on trying at this. Uh, but an, uh, I will, on your behalf, pass that question over to Sergio if you want to talk a, a bit about where we are currently in our uh, ability to compete, or, or blockchain companies' ability to compete effectively for against current solutions out there today. Yeah, it's when you say blockchain company, you're already almost uh, coming to an oxymoron, right? Because the blockchain That's is a technology true. and the company is a business. And Very fair. I'll, what has happened, and, and there's nothing wrong with it, I call them blockchain companies, too, but what's, uh, what's happened in the past few years is that um, beautifully, and it's great for evolution and for uh, innovation, that um, the entry barriers to delivering very sophisticated platform-based services uh, have lowered dramatically. Of course, building on top of a stack that has started with the creation of the internet. And so now we're at the point where anyone can quickly uh, um, jumpstart uh, a network uh, that uh, creates value and where developers can come in and uh, create more value and create services and products and where there's a all intertwined uh, activity of uh, multiple players from exchanges to um, uh, traditional money services for on and off ramping to um, to also identity. There's a lot of things converging all at once in this big uh, melting pot that is um, blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. So some companies that have focused, like we're very lucky to have here both uh, uh, Daniel and Sean from two of the most uh, advanced in uh, focusing in uh, for and optimizing for financial inclusion. Others have uh, focused on uh, uh, purely providing large computers or other uh, more uh, playful uh, ways to, to create uh, uh, finance and uh, unfortunately not so legitimate uh, financial schemes. So because of this, today we stand at a point where just unleashing the, the beast and opening the gates is not a solution. We have to uh, start working with uh, uh, regulations and with governments to have um, uh, top-down uh, approaches for real large inclusion. And this is um, one of the most important uh, elements of uh, uh, billions wide distribution is involving the governments from the get-go, from the real beginning. Because if you don't design together with the government, you're not going to reach a billion people. You, it's uh, look at the telcos. How did they? Uh, how mobile money went from helping um, I don't know if a single digit percentage points of other population in the world uh, getting somewhat banked in a span of a few years? Not because they were private enterprises uh, unregulated and started from a mom and pop shop, but because they already had a volume of business, they had uh, um, a legacy infrastructure, they have a government uh, um, support and uh, and um, and uh, um, what do you call it uh, um, contribution, yeah, subsidy, a lot of side government subsidy. So it all goes back to um, what's the what's the largest. Uh, channel that we have to go to market with uh, with blockchain. And it's not just by letting uh, um, mobile apps uh, pop up left and right on the App Store and leaving up, it up to the Android Store and Apple App Store right. to decide if the apps should be regulated or not. That's, that's the wrong way. Right. And they're not doing it right anyway. Yeah. I realized before um, we kind of switch over to digital assets, I realized um, we've been speaking at a very high level. This wasn't necessarily a prep question, but it is going to be a jump ball that I'm going to throw at the moderators here. What countries out there are you seeing that you admire that you think are working well, or at least exploring well, with blockchain technology in this area of democratization? Can you point to any country that you think is doing this? 
I think that there are a lot of countries that are taking the lead in terms of allowing this kind of technology. Yeah. I think one of the things that we get lost on is the fact that it's a tech stack. It's just like the internet. Like we're building the rails that other people can build on top of. And so these these institutions, these financial institutions are regulated by their local markets, the ones that build on top of Stellar, for example. And I think that there are some, we see a lot of activity. We have open corridors, um, the Nigeria to the US, Nigeria to, to Europe, Nigeria to the UK. Um, also in Latin America, we have you know assets that are transacting from from a different corridors from there to Nigeria to the U.S. to the U.K. Uh, to Europe, and so these are all like these countries have all opened the their um, the the doors to this kind of this the digital assets being utilized within them, and I think it's really important. There are only a few where they're restrictive, so I think that's the way to look at it: is that there are a few countries where there's restrictions, mm -hmm. and then there are many that are open to it. And really, frankly, it's incumbent upon us to make those regulators comfortable with what's happening um, with respect to this new potential uh, integration point. Japan, for example, did a really good job already a couple of years ago in having a fantastic regulatory framework to allow all sort of uh, banks and small and the startup companies and institutional banks jump at uh, digital assets together in blockchain based uh, security assets. Yeah. So, so my, my very quick take, not to just do the full round robin, I, I do think that the, this is a, a, a sort of a technology that's really come from the East, right, for, from the US perspective. Uh, Asia in particular, uh, I think in some countries, Singapore in particular, and some others have done a very nice job of at least laying out the, the, the sort of the rules of the game and allowing people to make good decisions from a business perspective to encourage innovation. And it's really spread across the globe. The quick statement is that, you know, we know that there's probably 70 something percent of, of um, central banks are having conversations about how to think about digital currency and what the implications are for their economy in terms of capital flight, in terms of sovereignty. Um, so there's there, this is a uh, bubbling under the surface, rapidly rising uh, initiative that um, you know many governments are starting to take uh, take a leadership position in, just because of the potential in terms of the cost and inclusion and all the things we've been talking about. Right. Um, we're getting some great questions coming uh, through the chat now. They're kind of higher level questions, which we will definitely address. I did want to touch upon digital assets first, specifically around central bank digital currencies and stable coins as potential um, tools to further the democratization of finance. Um, sorry, I was just going to try to catch Fernando again when he just left the stage. I feel so bad. So I'm going to throw this then at somebody. Uh, Danelle, why don't we start with you around central bank digital currencies? Um, will they help to make democratization of finance a reality? Oh, I think CBDCs can and will be a huge innovation in our lifetime, particularly as food as a tool for financial inclusion. You know, cash is ubiquitous because it's simple. Simplicity is what makes it accessible. And so today, uh, account-based money like cryptocurrency is very flexible, um, but there can be barriers to access. So I think CBDCs are really the in-between that make it all work, and they can and it can empower citizens all over the world. So digital cash is the path to financial inclusion. And frankly, CBDCs are exactly the type of digital asset that Stellar was designed for. Very easy to issue the asset. We want to interoperate all over the world. And so I think that blockchain generally can be really like this can be just something that makes it just explode if there are all of these different assets that people feel comfortable with because of they're backed by a central bank, that it makes it easy for it to be utilized on um, on a network. No, I can't. But what, Fernando, was that you? <laughs> Um, I think we just were able to hear you, but you're back on mute. Sorry, Danelle. I didn't know if you had any last thoughts there that you wanted to share. Nope, that's good. Thanks. So on, on this issue then of asset tokenization, and I mentioned as well stable coins, do, do we have a view on them, whether together with CBDCs or in and of themselves as a, as a unit to help also uh, democratize finance and reach underbanked communities? Yeah, uh, so I, I'll I'll jump in. I, I think certainly uh, CBDs, certainly stable coins are are, are a massive uh, opportunity uh, to help. I think alleviate some of the pressures that certain countries feel. Um, you know, if if you are in a country that's experiencing sort of exponential inflation and and people again back to the inclusivity point don't have access to sort of paper money that may be more stable. Um, you know, getting uh, their investment, putting their putting their um, you know hard earned funds into something like a stable coin and getting access there 
uh, I think uh, is a great way to preserve uh, wealth and preserve prosperity. Uh, I think they'll probably end up coexisting um, in the future. Uh, Algorand has both uh, Tether uh, and uh, USDC uh, now active uh, on our uh, blockchain. And um, I think we see those stable coins as great on ramps and off ramps and promoters of global liquidity uh, that I think should coexist with, um, with uh, national currencies that and ultimately end up as digital assets. That's, that's great. I, I share those same feelings with you, and I'm glad to know of Algorand's specific work in this area. Sergio, I don't know if you wanted to add any other yeah. thoughts on asset tokenization here. Yeah, in, in my view, the most important aspect of asset tokenization is um, inherent inclusivity of the platforms, because all of a sudden you can remove barriers for um, uh, distributors and small program operators to go to market and bring those assets to market without uh, the traditional silo um, environment of um, the old financial system. So all of a sudden you have uh, small players that could be a one man show in a, in a, um, in a garage or a mid sized company that used to be in retail and then decides to enter FinTech. And all of a sudden they can um, issue, uh, distribute, manage the digital assets like stable coins or and if you think about it, what a central bank is doing uh, when issuing digital currency is doing pretty much the same. So it's the same platform or platform infrastructure that benefits all layers for once. It's not just one solution for a central bank and another solution for uh, for small fintechs. It's it's right. all it's all one and the same, and the barriers are limited. So it's it's a bit like. Uh, air travel increased the uh, world, uh, the world economy, and of course, uh, everyone came uh, came afloat with the rising tide because uh, democratized travel allowed for better exchange of uh, of, um, of uh, business and and uh, views and, and politics and culture. Similarly, now we have um, the, the transportation of assets and the transportation of mechanisms of assets are. Uh, programmable accountability, I call it, even better than programmable money. Programmable money just means that you can somewhat define, like you do with software, what happens to a token. But programmable accountability means that you can shift the trust and you can allow um, a, a holder, a citizen, a constituent to decide whether they want to hold a digital dollar issued by a Circle, by Binance, by um, all of those, uh, or if they want instead to have the central bank issued one, and right. they come with pros and cons. So you really have your comparison table with the benefits and uh, and um, and downsides of each uh, of, of holding each one of those tokens and using them. I absolutely love that uh, programmable accountability. I don't think I've ever heard that yet, but it's so clear it's and elegant. Powerful. Right? It's really it's a really elegant and. Um, understandable way of really explaining the benefits, right? Of, of utilizing a digital currency. It's not necessarily trust or trustless, but accountability plays a big part in it. No, um, I can't, Nick? I can't hear you. Oh, we can, Fernando, we can hear you. Are you able to hear us now? Or he's back on mute. We um, can't hear, so we have to give him a hand <laughs> Well, I'll just do. Fernando. <laughs> Thanks in the chat. Um, all right. I, so how about this? For the next 15 minutes now, I would like to go and have a large discussion and we'll incorporate a lot of these great chat questions around really meeting the future, creating this uh, hopeful nirvana of, of that we would like to see, but there are incredible challenges to meet, you know, the barriers to make this happen. Um, one of the questions that we have, and Sean, I will kind of toss this your way around the general theme of barriers to adoption, but this question is really focused on the big banks themselves. And someone earlier had also mentioned, you know, incentives and, and challenges here. But the question is, you know, in the issue of un and underbanked, are the big banks themselves the major barriers? Um, for example, that you know they fund pay paycheck lending enterprises behind the scenes because they know they can make money off of this demographic. I personally, you know, when I was early on in blockchain and people were saying, oh, you know, this removes friction. And I would say a lot of people make money from friction. They don't necessarily want to go away. So how much are the big banks in a, a barrier here uh, to seeing this happen amongst all the barriers to adoption? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. 
Uh, and I'm not just paying that lip service. You know, I, I think we often end up in situations where for the we think it's the first time that technology is sort of brought about the sort of incumbent versus the challenger. And I think there's an awful lot of, of uh, business models that have shown that that entrenched competitors in any industry that don't adopt new technology at the right time end up going away. Um, you know, we always like to talk about Netflix or Blockbuster. Uh, many people on this uh, um, probably have never even heard of Blockbuster. And so you get into a situation where you have to adopt the future. And I think that these large banks are, for various reasons, starting to do it more and more. I mean, there are a lot of forward-leaning banks, traditional financial exchanges, et cetera, that are waking up, not just to the need for blockchain as a technology, but I'm sure Sergio can attest, the digitization of assets, funds, creating of asset-backed securities. So is it moving as fast as you know we would certainly like? No. Um, are there barriers that are uh, fundamental to the existing financial system that prevent people from accessing? Yes. If there wasn't, then blockchain probably wouldn't be here. And do we think that the really forward-leaning banks are going to adopt this uh, and embrace this technology quickly in order to um, take advantage of its pot potential? I think more and more so. And I will say one other thing really quickly is that, you know, one of the biggest issues I think that a lot of times these banks have experienced with blockchain is, again, uh, they've let the chain have a lot and uh, by lacking performance in both the, in the design, it, it degrades their At user. The top, give a right click. Now let me know, do you see anywhere it says? Sorry, just a second. Fernando, Fernando, we want to hear you, but sorry. Go ahead, Sean. No, no. So, so I guess what I was saying is there's no rational industry or individual that would intentionally use something that degrades their user experience. As an example, if I walk, you know, if I walked into a room and I flipped a light switch and it took eight minutes for the light to go on and I wasn't sure if the light was really going to go on, mm -hmm. that's not the greatest user experience if it's a transaction or exchange of value. And that happens a lot in many blockchains. Right. If you can have the performance and the latency and the speed that allows you to instantaneously experience something using this new technology for lower cost and uh, and much more securely, then all of a sudden adoption will start growing. These bigger banks will have more confidence in being able to start to move into the space and really take advantage of the cost savings and the user uh, experience improvements rather than uh, degradation that they get with a lot of other chains now. Right. And then, Janelle, I was wondering, I, I, I'm still taken by your thoughts earlier around education and literacy um, and physical distance and culture in general. Blockchain doesn't take those away, right? I mean, are, are those still existing barriers, no matter how great this technology can be? Or are there ways that we can get over those barriers utilizing blockchain technology or through our learnings from blockchain? Well, there are certain of those barriers that that any kind of technology where you can access it from your mobile device is going to be is going to remove them. With respect to those in specific, I think this all gets down to usability. I think that you know one of the things that the largest barrier right now for blockchain technology is that we focus on it as blockchain technology and not just a tech stack that we're building on to make it very usable and to solve user problems. If we focus on solving user problems using this fine this like really awesome technology that's out there, no user needs to understand how the technology works. No user fully understands, unless you want to get into it, how the internet works. It's the same exact thing. So it's really making it so that the use case and the UX design, you know, Forrester talks about the fact that every dollar invested in UX means that you, you, you'll get a return of $100. It's the exact same thing that we need to focus on. It's usability. It's solving real user problems. It's keeping it super simple. And it's focusing on the user experience, particularly when you're when you're trying to get them involved in new technology. You know, we just launched a wallet focused on Latin America. It's called Vibrant. And if you look at what we did in that wallet, we really focused on user interaction. Like you, if you, for example, just like key recovery, key recovery can be super challenging for people. They can they have to write their secret key down and make sure they don't lose it. Well, what we tried to do in this is to make it so that it's just like if you lose your uh, your password for your uh, email account. So that's how you can access it. So there's a whole bunch of technology that goes on behind it to make that work. But the most important thing that we can do as shepherds of this like phenomenal technology is to make it simple, make it easy. It's the same, frankly, from the standpoint of these big banks. If we make it simple, we make it easy, we make it so that they, they see the value to them. Competition is amazing and it creates like a really amazing innovation loop. So that's what we need to focus on. 
is just making it simple for everyone to be able to use this technology. Um, okay. I will now go to a question from the chat, but kind of combine it with a topic, Sergio, I know that you are also a kind of keen to address, which is the lack of documentation. Uh, that there are many barriers here, but especially as we think about vulnerable populations. So from the chat, they point out things around regulatory hurdles, right? Financial blockages, vulnerable internet connectivity and infrastructure, especially in conflict zones. I mean, there's so many things here that are barriers within the, co the countries and the people themselves. But within those related directly to the economic, uh, economic circumstances that many of the unbanked population currently finds themselves in, let's just first talk about the lack of documentation, right? And how digital yeah. identities can be leveraged to mitigate this issue. Yeah, it's intertwined. I, I see a lot of convergence between identity and um, the finance. So in fact, what we usually say is that we help uh, bring in digital assets to mainstream, not necessarily identifying assets as uh, money or an identity or credentials or somewhere in between. The problem is very um, sensitive and big. In my experience, I've learned, for example, that in the Philippines, most uh, people that are unprivileged and live in, um, in, uh, uh, in the, at the bottom of the pyramid don't have access to a government issued identity, may or may not have had a birth certificate, probably lost it, paper, they live in a in a shanty town, it's hard to really keep it and maintain it. So what really happens is that by the time they start working, they uh, their employer gives them a um, photo ID uh, to access maybe a building or, or the employment uh, facilities, and uh, that becomes their ID for the rest of their life. So that is one, one situation where you can see how people work around the problem, but you can also see the the desperate situation and you can see how it opens up for um, mal malicious players to to mess up the situation. Myanmar is another situation where uh, it's quite desperate, frankly. Uh, usually the refugees that keep crossing border between um, Bangladesh and Myanmar end up throwing away their um, UN issued IDs from the refugee camps because it's a way to identify them as uh, a susceptible group. And so they'd rather get away with their ID than um, being uh, given access to services with the same ID. Uh, on the positive end, we have other situations like uh, in Kenya, where the counties, which are more like the states within Kenya, are somewhat sovereign in their ability to a defined identity and tax collection program. And so they merged the two. And now they're uh, spearheading initiatives where with a single system, you can uh, claim your identity, but also collect benefits and also uh, pay taxes and uh, and wages and everything all, all in one single instrument, be it a phone or a card, the phone doesn't matter. Kenya luckily has MPESA, which has laid the foundation. So almost everyone has a phone and you can do that like in Thailand or in China. But other countries that don't have uh, mobile phone penetration, you really need the instruments that are more basic than a phone to distribute this. And luckily, with the, the w fantastic work that the W3C has, Working Group for Identity has, um, has brought forward, uh, we have standards like uh, DID, decentralized identifiers, DIDCOM, and verifiable credentials, which are basically what we all know about money brought over to, to identity. So all anchored on uh, um, key management and sovereignty of ownership of the keys, and then very interoperable when it comes to having um, verifiers and issuers of credentials and, and the holders uh, work in an uh, in interoperable way where developers can bring over um, their, their applications that connect everything. And that's why I, I see KYC is one of the biggest hurdles to digital assets because digital assets are too fluid. And identity is too rigid, so you need this interface, which is KYC, which is horrid. <laughs> and so having a digital identity platform that is as open as HTTP protocol, but as powerful as uh, as the internet uh, will, will probably be the big, uh, biggest friction remover in that sense. Right. Yeah, and we have around five minutes left. I would encourage people to continue to put questions in chat. 
Um, the, the last question I referred to, they also talked about regulatory hurdles and regulation as a, as a barrier. I don't know, Danelle or Sean, if you had specific views on, on how regulatory obstacles might be overcome, especially again, as we think about um, vulnerable populations and perhaps countries where you don't have the most solid regulatory structure right now to begin with. I think that regulation is the it, what we did wrong on the on the internet side, for example. I mean, on the content side of the web, when we focused on privacy, where we said regulators will do it on our own and we'll make it work, and you don't really know how to do this. That was the wrong approach. We're seeing fruits of that today, right? Like just in terms of how regulators are now jumping into this in an aggressive way. Um, what we need to do on this side is really engage, and it doesn't really matter where you engage. You have to where, whether the whether they're um, stable in, from a regulatory standpoint or not. You have to engage, and so we spend a lot of time focusing on this just for the blockchain industry at large, not just focusing on Stellar, because from our standpoint, like this is just a really important thing to get comfortable to get regulators all over the world comfortable with blockchain technology and what that technology has to offer inside payments, but also in other areas. And so I think it's just a, I don't think of it so much as a barrier. I think it's an opportunity to provide the kind of education and to talk in the same way that we just didn't do so well on the content side of the web in the early days. We need to do that here. And I think that that's going to get us to a place where from a regulatory standpoint, there'll be more openness. And already we're already seeing this all over the place, right? More openness to engagement, more recognition that particularly when you have a global pandemic going on, we recognize that, you know, that there's there are very few borders all over the world that are respected, right? Not many things not respect borders. So we need to engage in a way that's um, that's going to make it useful for everyone and just provide that base level feedback. And to many people are afraid when you say blockchain or they have fear about crypto. And I think it's important for us to to remove that as an option as a as a problem yeah. for us. Yeah. I I would uh, I would agree. I think um, certainly there's uh, still fairly rampant confusion about blockchain versus crypto. Blockchain, the regulatory environment isn't really the situation. It's it's more the cryptocurrency, and then on top of that, it's all of the different companies in the DeFi space, in particular, or anyone else who are looking to build a particular asset that might be classified as a security. And I think from our perspective, I think engagement makes a lot of sense. I think educating people about the difference between technology and uh, currency is kind of funny to say, but that that's important and i think um I de just additional clarity i mean the fact is again we talked about banks and the question about banks adopting or not adopting you know i think countries that are more forward leaning in in just describing uh the parameters um and being clear will see far greater innovation it isn't even about the currency as much as it is technical development and innovation and and uh entrepreneurship and so companies that don't do or countries that don't do it are going to fall right. behind and the United States in particular, you know, I think is getting better uh, and is starting to see that that is something. But again, uh, uh, still a long ways to go. Right. Yeah, if I can add on uh, how important the China effect is being today on pushing other countries to progress in mobile money in uh, the regulations in central bank digital currency and basically ubiquitous access to, to digital assets. Right. And I would say I'm not saying it was done the right way, but it was done. Right. And I would say too, and I think in the United States, even just the challenge during um, distribution of PPP, right? And realizing that yeah. we need to have a better financial infrastructure here has also made it yeah. made uh, people in Washington certainly uh, take a much more acutely aware <laughs> a look at um, yeah. digital currencies and uh, blockchain and other types of um, digital asset infrastructure. So for my very last question to each of you, I know that we're all optimistic people. We wouldn't be in this space if we were pessimistic. But on a scale of like mm, very cautiously optimistic about uh, democratization of finance to like this is totally this is to the moon this is going to happen this is wonderful you know we've outlined some of the possibilities but we also acknowledge a lot of barriers so are you guys cautiously optimistic of greater democratization of finance and and underbanked populations being able to have greater access through blockchain technology are you cautiously optimistic there or you're like, oh, so excited, and it's totally going to happen. It'll be great. So, Danelle, what is your view there? I'm already seeing it. She's so well, she, she went off to make it happen. <laughs> I don't want to see it happen. She's in. I think she's very excited. Uh, I, I can speak. Not for her, but I would say that, look, I, I'm at best a pragmatic optimist, yes. and that's where I am right okay. now. I think that... Um, 
I think that uh, we're seeing a ton of adoption uh, and a lot of forward movement. And again, I think it comes back to thinking about usability and designing in ways that people see as enhancing their interaction and their experience with whatever economy they're in versus degrading it. As the tech improves, I think so will the acceleration of the um, the movement to democratize and to expand inclusivity across the world. Great. Pragmatic optimist, I love it. And then uh, Sergio? Yeah, I see it happening. Uh, hopefully, Daniel is back with us. We, so we all see it happening. But uh, I am very uncomfortable with a few uh, potential problems and, and uh, obstacles to real um, access. Yeah. One is that vertical integration is only good for Tesla and Apple, but when it comes to democratizing access to digital assets in the world, vertical integration is a real enemy. Having one single player, one single government really dictates the whole value chain from the, the user interface to the underlying assets and issuance is, uh, is usually um, not good. And we've seen it happening with, um, uh, as Danelle mentioned earlier, with uh, privacy. Yeah. Uh, it may not really end up well if one player has uh, has it all under their control. So I would not want Tangent to completely own and control the, the digital assets economy in the world. Yeah, the that, it would not yeah, be right. The work that you're doing in this space, the work that you all are doing in this space should be applauded. Thank you so much as well for your participation on this panel. Thanks to the audience for your questions. It's been a pleasure being here with you today. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.